Ah, uh, Undertale. Unless you live under a rock, you know about Undertale. Toby Fox's magnum opus, the big boy indie RPG hit. I didn't kickstart it, or even play the demo back then, but I did know about Toby Fox from his music in Homestuck. Yeah, I know. I was a Homestuck back in the day. Anyway, a bit of time after it came out, while scrolling on Tumblr, may it rest in peace, I remember coming across this post. To describe it, this artist Kuken Kujira decided to ask this question. What if Undertale were on the Game Boy? They drew up some concept art for it, and I thought it looked super cool. At the time, I didn't even know much of DMAKES or the idea of recreating a game on lower hardware, but just the idea of Undertale being played on a console released in 1989 would be so cool. What really pops out to me is the aesthetic of the Game Boy. The beautifully limited color palette of four greens! I don't actually have any nostalgia for the Game Boy though. It came out in 1989, and that was seven years before I was even born. However, I did have a love for the Game Boy Color. I had seen Game Boys before, those big old chonkers. Anyway, fast forward to last year, I was bored and really wanted to start a cool project that I actually finished this time. So thinking back to that old Tumblr post, a thought came to me. What if I tried to demake Undertale? on the Game Boy. So no one asked, but I put Undertale on the Game Boy. Okay, uh, so how in the world do you make games for obsolete systems? Can I just drag and drop the EXE onto a flash cart and just run it from there? Sadly, no. For a bit of background, I am an okay artist, an okay composer, and a really okay programmer. Before this dumb project, I thought I would have to open up some guides and learn how to code in assembly. Ew. At least that's why I thought it took to do this. I did come across this library called the Game Boy Development Kit, or GBDK for short. In that, it looks like you code in C and create the game from that. I have a bit of C knowledge so it wouldn't be the worst thing to code. Sounds better than assembly. However, looking a bit more, I came across Game Boy Studio. It looked like a straight up game engine used to create Game Boy games with ease. I looked at it and I thought, damn, that was easy. This is going to be a breeze. It wasn't easy. So originally, when I first embarked on this journey to recreate Undertale, I set the goal of basically recreating the whole demo for the game. If you don't know, the Undertale demo encompasses the ruins in its entirety, including the Toriel fight. However, as I was working, I thought that scope was way too big. So then I was like, okay, well I can do up until Toriel's house, just omitting the Toriel battle. <laughs> um, all right, so maybe I can just do up until the Napster Blue. Uh, all right, okay, okay. What if I just did the Flowey battle? and maybe one other one. That seems reasonable. So, I downloaded Game Boy Studio, watched a couple of YouTube videos, and went to work. Now, before we get to the actual game development, I started working on this around the end of August of last year. So, I would say this has been a year of development, but I'd be lying. It was more like a month of work, getting stuck, not working on it for six months, coming back and thinking, damn, I don't know what I'm doing. Working a little bit more, stopping again and getting stuck. Thinking to myself, haha, I'll just get this done by Undertale's anniversary. Um, the anniversary came and went though, but it's still within the month of release. So I'd call it a win in my book. So next I'll be talking about how I did the art, the programming and the music for the game. Since I kind of worked in that order. Enjoy the absolute mess. So as you know, Undertale is a mostly pixel art game. I have dabbled a little bit with pixel art before, and I do own Acebrite, probably the most popular pixel art program. So I'm not starting from scratch here. As I alluded to before, the beauty of the Game Boy 
is that it is limited to a four color palette. So let's start with designing the backgrounds. Since Undertale is so popular, it's pretty easy to get a full map of each area to work with if you look it up on Google. Now due to the limitations of the Game Boy, there's quite a bit I can't do. First, I can have a background exceed 2039 pixels on the width or the height. And even that is a bit more dubious, as seen in the Game Boy Studio documentation. Also, something big to note is that no matter how large the background is, it can't have more than 192 unique 8x8 squares. The Game Boy basically splits up the background by the unique squares and stores it in memory if I had to guess. So even on the smallest background, which is 160 by 144 pixels, or the screen size of the Game Boy, only about half of the 8x8 tiles can be unique. That's quite a limitation. In the footage, you can see that I have the Undertale map on one side and me trying to replicate that style on the other. Also, you'll note that I made the picture be in black and white so that I can more easily see the value or light and darknesses the background has. That's an art trick I learned since it makes it easier to see what pops out to the human eye. I basically just go in, figure out what of the four colors I'm going to use and try to replicate it like Undertale. Because of the pixel limitation, I try my best to evoke the same look as Undertale without as much detail like the flower bed that the player starts on. With each background, I would drag and drop it into Game Boy Studio and see how it would look I think I did a pretty good job at translating the maps. However, this one map gave me a bit of trouble as I didn't really pay attention to the tile limit I was allotted for the background and it had exceeded the limit by at least 15 tiles. Oof. So I had to go back and remove some of the work I did for that map. Now besides the backgrounds, another important aspect to the art is of course the sprites. Now originally, Game Boy Studio limited the sprites to only be 16 by 16 pixels which is pretty small. If you think about it, an average monitor has 1920 by 1080 pixels. So 16 by 16 pixels is this tiny little square. Anyway, additionally, sprites could only be three colors instead of four. So I drew up Frisk. Now I know what you're thinking. Oh, I see four colors in that sprite sheet. A still observation, Sherlock. But the light green is actually the transparency of the Game Boy. Now for the last time, get out of my damn house, Holmes. You'll notice that I have six sprites in total for all the animation. Two for down, two for up, and two for right. Game Boy Studio has a built-in top-down game features, and it will flip the right sprite when the character moves left. Now two frames of animation isn't exactly fluid, but you work with what you get. Games like Link's Awakening did that, and it looks pretty sick. I'm not super down with the way Frisk looks here, though so I redrew them later. After that, I worked on Toriel. Now because of the sprite limitation, I drew her in two parts, the top and bottom. However, upon trying to animate her, she didn't exactly work right. So this is the first time I got stuck. Shout out to the Game Boy Studio Discord. The community there is really cool and the people had solutions to making bigger sprites. However, it required an external plugin and it would also eat at my actor limit, so I decided against it. Um, more details on actors later. So I got stuck and kind of pushed this project to the side. In the meantime though, I, uh, I got a rabbit. Now fast forward to December and Game Boy Studio 3.0 comes out. And you want to know what feature spoke to me the most? <laughs> That's right, bigger sprites, baby! <clears throat> So I connected Toriel back with her bottom half and started working on the battle sprites. The battle sprites in Undertale are monochromatic, so I emulated that as well. And not to toot my own horn, but Flowey and Toriel look really good. Now with all that done, I can talk about how the game is programmed in the Game Boy Studio engine itself. Oh, the code. Where? Where do I even begin? I'm going to preface this with the fact that I want each section of this video to be around the same length. I know the music was probably going to be the shortest length though, and the coding slash using the engine would be the longest. However, the more I wrote, the longer this section became. I'm going to try to make this brief. As I said before, I am okay at programming, so please expert, don't yell at me. I will cry. So Game Boy Studio basically a game engine for the Game Boy. 
And here's what the project window looks like. The game is broken up into scenes, aka the backgrounds I created in the art section. These backgrounds are connected by triggers, those little blue lines you kind of see. For example, in the starting area, when you enter the trigger in from the door, that little orange area, you get transported to the specific place highlighted in blue. What's cool is that when you're highlighting a scene, it shows you all the triggers going in and out of the scene. You can see that after the tile screen, the player will start in the bed of flowers, just like in Undertale. For the top-down games, you can see that the red blocks surrounding the map are bounding boxes, or places where the player cannot go. These bounding boxes, as well as placing actors with triggers, are found in this toolbox. In each scene, you can set the player's sprite sheet. This is great because especially in Undertale, the player is technically two different things. The Frisk sprite and the Heart sprite. So next we should talk about the actors. The actors are the player or any entity that can be interacted with. Or at least, that's mostly how it works. Projectiles don't exactly account towards the entity limit or are even called entities. It's kind of weird. I would imagine it being that way, like in other game engines or things I've used. But anyway, the characters, switches, enemies, signs, and the aesthetic only save button are entities. Something I alluded to earlier is that probably due to the computing power of the Game Boy, for each scene, there's a limited amount of actors that can be on screen. So now for the actual scripting. Game Boy Studio has a bunch of pre-made events, or I like to think of them as functions that you can do all sorts of things, or like a, a library. The documentation goes through it because there's a lot of events, similar to a lot of other game engines with built-in functions. For stuff like dialogue, actor, movement, math, storing variables, if statements, loops, etc. As you know, in Undertale, I consider it a two-phase game. One faces the overworld, and the other faces battles. For the overworld part, in the ruins, there is a ton of scripted sequences where Toriel walks you through the ruins. I didn't realize this, but doing these sequences was kind of annoying. So one thing I immediately realized is that scenes only have an initialization script and a on-hit-player script. As it suggests, the init script is the first thing that fires before anything else does on the screen. I use this to basically have a lot of Toriel scripted sequences fire, like her dialogue and such, when entering a new scene. Now when I say new, there's a bunch of flags that have to be checked for that, but I needed to make sure that these did not fire again when you go back to the room. So came the annoying process of having a billion flags, checking what you did in each room. Did you fight Flowey? No? Well, don't start the tutorial script for dialogue. That can mess things up. If you look at the screen, Turtle's on the left. I basically transport her position where she needs to be when necessary because there's no other way I could think of it without spawning actors. You can't actually spawn an actor in a scene. I think this is similar to like old engines or hardware where you have to have stuff stored in a specific location to bring them in. So in each subsequent room, there's a check basically in place if you already completed the room and checks keep piling and piling and it is not fun and I keep forgetting them. Like this room with the spike puzzle, there are checks for if you've been here, if you enter the trigger where the first frogget fight happens. And what's worse, this scripted sequence where Poryo holds your hand I couldn't figure out. Not because I couldn't figure out how to do a scripted sequence, I was getting lazy. I just couldn't figure out how to make these spikes show up only when you step on them because you could only have a certain amount of actors. So I gave up and did a simpler solution where you just walk around them. I'm going to stop here because I could go on more about the specific things I had problems with, but this would be really long. Anyway, I'm just going to keep it to this. I did the rooms. They were annoying. And we haven't even gone to battles yet. I was alluding to earlier that for a given scene, sure, there's going to be an initialization script. But where's the update script? Like the thing that fires for every frame constantly. Those are on actors, but they're not on the scenes. And the worst part is, is the player doesn't even have any scripts attached to them. Like you can't have an initialization one or an update one. It only has them for actors. Why do I find this an issue? Well, let's just say sometimes for rooms where I'm checking the player on an update for XYZ, I just use a random actor to do all these update checks, which is weird, but I'm just, I'm using what I got. Either way, we need to actually talk about the battles. Now I think these work similar to how they work in Pokemon. In Pokemon, when you enter the tall grass, each step is basically a dice roll. 
Let's say a D20 is rolled, and I'm rolling a one. A battle starts. I don't be. I don't know the exact odds, but that sounds reasonable to me. Keep in mind, we are going to be rolling this for each step. So, following a helpful guide, I wanted to implement how this guide worked, where every movement in a trigger causes a random chance of an encounter. But uh, in the latest version of Game Boy Studio. Now triggers are only activated on entering and leaving them, so you can't have a script that runs for every step. Needless to say, I was stuck. Again. This is pretty hilarious because I used this system for like two screens. So this is where I truly got lazy. I made a bunch of triggers where on enter of each of them, there's a random chance of entering a battle. They say game devs are lazy, but they don't know the struggle. So finally, we're on to the actual battle screen. As you know in Undertale, the battles are comprised of the player doing something, acting, fighting, sparing, attempting to flee, and a bullet hell style game where you dodge the bullets that the enemy shoot at you. Now because of how small the screen of the Game Boy is, it would make those battles really small. And in an ingeniously lazy move, I decided to split the screens into a bullet hell mode and the menuing. This proved to be the best decision, because I can easily script the bullet sequence with each screen for each enemy. So for example, Froggit has two different bullet patterns, a flying attack and a jumping frog attack. The frog attack was easy to implement. I basically stored the player's position, frog jumps, it jumps to that general area and it jumps back down. Now the fly attack, I looked at it a bit. The idea of it is that the flies will spawn randomly, go towards the player's last position, stop, and then go again to the next last position in a loop. However, for some reason, I had issues registering this properly. I tried a number of different solutions where the flies were doing different kind of movement patterns and it just didn't work. They kept on attacking the player multiply and ended up killing the player easily. I almost gave up and just made the spawn randomly in a straight line. But then at my last legs, I tried something. On a hit of a player, deactivate the fly. And it worked. I don't think you understand how much I was banging my head against the wall for this one. So there's a lot more I could talk about with scripting, but I'm going to leave it at that. I really don't want this to be any longer. So now we can finally talk about the sound and music. I, uh, all right. To be honest, I don't know how to talk about music. Uh, it, I've never been trained formally with music composition, so I'm basically really winging it for this part. So here's what I'll talk about. The Game Boy, as I'm sure you know, has a sick chiptune sound. Some people may call it a hardware limitation. And sure, they may be factually correct, but I do love me some good chiptune. So the Game Boy, for all its sounds, has four channels simplify that basically only four things can be played at once two square waves one programmable wave table and a noise channel so you're not going to be playing 1e instrument symphonies with this thing but that's cool no matter limitation has brought some really cool outcomes now in order to make music on the game boy and this also works for the nes people use what are called trackers I've never personally used a tracker, but I was prepared to learn them. However, luckily, with one of the most recent Game Boy Studio releases, they introduced their own built-in composer. What the best part about this is for me is that they have a usual tracker built-in, but they also have a piano roll. It looks like this, and you basically plop down the notes on it from left to right, and it plays it you know, sequentially in that order. So going back to the four channels thing, I don't really know the music terms for it, but I use one channel for the main melody, one for backing, one for the bass line, and lastly, I use a noise channel. Now the noise channel sounds, you know, it makes noise, but it's surprisingly good at doing drum sounds. Now I wanted to originally give the soundtrack a bit of a remixy feel, you know, do some really cool stuff, but um, as I was getting close to being done, my creative muscles died. And now I'm doing as little as possible here. So I'd listen to a song, try to recreate it note for note as best as I could. And if it sounded off, I decided I'd cheat a little and use a MIDI. 
well, not actually use a MIDI, as in like look at a MIDI of it sequentially. For Flowey's theme slash Your Best Friend, for example, it seems like Toei Fox basically used a chip tune slash 8-bit sound font. So I think I did a good job of doing that. Here, have a listen. For Fallen Down, this one sound-wise is a little different, but I think I still nailed that one too. However, from here on then, the laziest is on full display. The ruins and every other parts of the songs I got so tired of working on that I was super lazy with. I made them as simple as possible. I'm sure composers with more creativity than I could do miles better but doing all this by yourself really does put a toll on you. And I would actually like to finish this project. Oh, and I almost forgot, but sound effects fall into this section too. To make it simple, I was completely unaware of this, but you can just add sound effects straight into the Game Boy Studio. They had to be a certain file type and parameters, but they generally work. But finally, we could see it all in action. So now that we have it all done, let me show you how it actually plays and compares it to Undertale. So I borrowed my friend's Game Boy Color, expecting it to work, and it does, but uh... It, it works, but um, I... I can't see this at all! So I went out, bought a Game Boy Advance SP because it has a backlight, and a Game Boy Advance because I was tempted by the Facebook Marketplace ads, and they won. And now here's a showcase. The game ends right after the wind zone fight, as I had no more creative uses to do more. I hope you all enjoy this journey, and I can't wait to do another small project. I will link the project on itch.io, and you can play it directly on the browser, but I'd suggest downloading the .gameboy file and running it on a Game Boy emulator like GBG. The sound effects on the web player are kind of booty, and they don't sound very good, but on the actual hardware and the Game Boy emulator, it works pretty well. All right, uh, thanks for watching. This is the end slate. Uh, as you can see, Fenoglio is enjoying delicious greens. And I actually have a second rabbit. Her name is Megara. She's black and white. And Fenoglio's cool and she's cool, but she's the one that gets a little more annoying with stuff. Um, if you want to see more projects like this or like demakes, remakes, twisting ideas, twisting like old ideas for games and stuff like that, uh, feel free to let me know uh, and subscribe. Also follow me on Twitter. I might be posting more like behind the scenes stuff with games and stuff like that. And yeah, um, it's been super exciting to get to work on this. And sure, it did take me a lot longer than expected, but I'm sure that other projects won't be like that. Especially since I won't be working on quite limited hardware. But yeah, this is the Chronomaniac signing off. Bye bye.